Hi, and welcome to the first prize ceremony of Jan Söderberg's Family Prize. And as you might have figured out, I am Jan Söderberg. <laughs> My family and I moved to London in 1991. And at that time, we could have chosen to play to uh, any place to live, so long as it was in Skåne. We chose to settle down in Lund out of many reasons. One of them being that they had a well-known university. A university creates a special atmosphere and culture to a city. The students make the city come alive, not to mention all the parties and carnivals. Something which I think our sons have enjoyed quite a lot during their youth. The School of Economics and Management is an important part of Lund University. The school has been in rap rapid development during the last 30 years and has, through the ambitions, goals and progressive thinking, becoming one of the leading business schools in the Nordic. The purpose of this prize is, of course, to find the most talented person with extraordinary research findings, something I am certain we have succeeded in doing this year. The prize will hopefully also put more light on our school, increase the cooperation with other business schools and make our students and staff even more engaged in their studies and research work. We are happy and grateful for the efforts made by the members of the prize committee and for the school, helping out by arranging these two days. Without your dedication and support, this would not have been possible. So again, thank you all. The chairman of the prize committee, Fredrik Andersson, and he's also the dean of the school, will further present this year's prize winner. But I just want to take the opportunity to say that I'm very pleased that we have nominated Professor Marianne Bertrand, a professor who has contributed in a grand way within the field of social economics, among others, I would say. I am sure her research and finding will give us all an eye-opener, regardless of what our everyday occupation is. With that said, I wish all a pleasant and educational afternoon and we look forward to Marianne's lectures, which will be held shortly. Thank you. Yes, good afternoon. I am Fredrik Andersson, and this is indeed a privilege standing here. This is the first ceremony for the award of the John Söderberg Family Prize in Economics and Management. And there are many reasons to be deeply delighted to be in this very spot at this very moment. First, it is a great privilege of this school to have friends like John Söderberg and his family. They have been involved with the school for a long time and they have a deep interest in what we do. They have now yet again been willing to make a commitment that makes a real difference. Thank you, thank you. Second, it has been a privilege to work in the committee. We have had a glimpse from the best possible angle of progress in research in economics and management. And then, of course, it is a privilege and a great pleasure to stand here to introduce uh, the inaugural winner of the prize, Professor Marianne Bertrand. Uh, before re reading a little bit from the motivation, <coughs> just let me note informally that the work that is being awarded today is really makes me happy on several counts. First, it transcends, it transcends the boundaries between basic research and application. There is no shortage of armchair recipes for reaching impact and relevance. Mar Marianne Bertrand's work shows that the key ingredient to any such re recipe is curiosity into contemporary problems and issues. The work, moreover, bridges economics and management, and it brings analytical techniques and ingenuity 
in the use of data to bear on core issues in societal discourse, in public policy, and in social science. And finally, and to be honest, closest to my own heart, uh, Marianne's work cuts right into uh, the culture wars, providing reason and evidence into some of the most salient, salient questions surrounding gender, identity, and power. So, thus, from this privileged position, let me just read a little bit from the form of motivation. We have the pleasure of awarding the prize to Professor uh, Marianne Baton, Chris P. Diolunas, Distinguished Service Professor uh, of Economics at Booth School of Business at the University of Chicago. Uh, now let me read. Marianne Bertrand is one of the world's most prominent applied microeconomists. Her published work focuses on some of today's most important and controversial <coughs> issues. Inequality, discrimination, sexism, CEO compensation and social divergence. Professor Bertrand's research uh, encompasses an outstanding breadth uh, and exemplifies the enormous potential inherent in contemporary methods such as machine learning, big data, and randomized controlled experiments for addressing key questions in social science. Marianne Baton's work is an aspiration for researchers in both economics and management. Her focus on issues such as inequality and discrimination also echoes well with the core research agenda of the school. It is a pleasure for everyone involved to declare Marianne Baton the winner of the first Jan Söderberg. Family Prize in Economics and Management. So, And now we will have the pleasure of listening to Professor Baton uh, and presuming technology works, which I believe it does. I think the clicker is on. Yes. Oh, give me a second. Yes. That's great. Let me try to attach this. Yep. Great, perfect. Well, thank you, thank you so much um, to everyone for being here. Thank you so much uh, to Jens Soderberg and his family. It's, um, it's extremely humbling and um, just, yeah, very special day. So thank you so much for this and thanks for Frederick and thanks to the nominating committee for their work. Um, and yeah, <laughs> thank you. <laughs> um, so um, what, I, what, I, what I will do in, in this, um, in, in this fairly short lecture is, is try to give an overview of uh, of a research agenda on on gender. Um, some of it is some of it is mine, but really I'm I'm going to be borrowing on um, a lot of uh, work by uh, by others. Um, and I guess that you know to put you know to put what's going to come in in background, I, I think there's no doubt that if you look at the last half century and you look really around the world, and I have in mind the developed world, but in fact. Most of the developing world as well, except for maybe some parts of sub-Saharan Africa and Asia, women have made substantial uh, progress. I think you can see that in terms of educational achievement. I'm going to talk a bit more about this. You can see that in terms of um, kind of gains in uh, labor force participation. You can also see that in terms of the gender gap in earnings that has been uh, that has been going on. So these facts, you know, have been you know kind of well established. I'm going to talk briefly about education because I think this is one of the most um, the most striking one it used to be that, you know, kind of 30 years ago, you would write a paper on the, on the gender gaps uh, in the labor market, and you would always start with, well, women are less educated than men, and hence that's a big part of the explanation as to why women are not earning as much as men. But now there's been, in the U.S., I'm going to use a lot of U.S. data, but 
the phenomenon that I'm going to talk about is, is nothing uh, specific to the US, it's, it's all over the world, a big reversal. So this is essentially tracking birth cohorts of, of men and women and looking at the share of individuals in those birth cohorts that have completed at least a college degree. And while, you know, if you go back to the 1950s, birth cohort there used to be more men with college degrees than women, we have since then huge, um, seen a huge reversal. In fact, you know, the phenomenon in the US is such that women's educational achievement keep on going up, and men have not made uh, much progress in terms of the educational attainment since, um, since the 1970s birth cohort. For having looked at you know, Scandinavian data, I believe that the gender gap in educational achievement is in fact the largest in Scandinavia uh, compared even bigger than it, is, uh, than it is in the US. So it is certainly the case that women today, in fact, for now many, many decades, um, have accumulated more, uh, more education than, uh, than men have. Now, there is a large literature uh, that has been, you know, kind of focused on really trying to document what is explaining this you know, kind of gains that women have made in terms of educational achievement, in terms of labor force participation, in terms of, of earnings. Um, there's been fantastic work that has shown that innovations have played an important role in um, these, these gains for women. I think two key sources of innovation, innovation in terms of, in terms of birth control, uh, but also the kind of innovations that have changed our homes. The dishwasher and the washing machine uh, have made it such that women have been able to spend less time in the home and hence devote more time to, uh, to the labor market. It is also true that there's been better regulatory controls against discrimination and also true that the changes that have been happening in terms of labor demand because of um, the changes in the uh, industrial structure of the economy have been somewhat favorable to women with um, kind of um, the kind of skills that women tend to have uh, being in higher demand than they, were, uh, than they were in the past. Yet, despite all of this, and this is really what I want to focus on, it, it's, it's very clear that women remain underrepresented in the highest earnings, uh, highest income occupations uh, in the economy. And whenever you're going to find them within those occupations, they tend to earn substantially less than, uh, than men do. So just, you know, a few, um, a few figures and tables to, you know, to talk about these facts. This is the, actually, I was in the restroom, and this number was in the bathroom. So I think you guys know this fact if you use the bathrooms at Lund University. <laughs> Um, this is a share of women uh, that are uh, at the head of Fortune 500 companies. There's been infinite progress in that we went from zero to a positive number um, over the last um, 30, year, um, 30 years. But it remains the case that less than 5% of Fortune 500 companies are, are headed by, uh, by women. And you, know, you could go you know, kind of down the corporate hierarchy and you find slightly more women in a C-suite and slightly more women if you go in upper management just below the C-suite, so these parameters exist, but the higher up you go, the less representation of women um, in, uh, in corporate America, but really kind of worldwide in the corporate sector. Um, try to, trying to move, you know, kind of beyond just this yeah, kind of small group of CEOs, these are the kind of facts that, you know, you could put together for the U.S. So this is looking at um, 25, to 60, 25 to 64 years old women that have at least a college degree. And this is tracking in census data the share of these women, kind of educated women, that are in the workforce. And you can see that we've moved from about a 60% labor force participation for college-educated women in the 1970s to about 81% uh, by, uh, by 2010. What is, I think, also very well established is that the labor force participation of women has been going up, but we have essentially reached what you know, looks like a plateau in the US since the mid-1990s. The number for 1990 is essentially the, the same number as it is for 2010. That phenomenon, this kind of plateauing in the rise of women's labor force participation, is, a, is more of a, a US phenomenon. It is not as uh, true in the rest of Europe, and I'll talk a little bit about the whys um, later on in the presentation. The bottom part of the table is really kind of documenting what you know, I think you could really call the glass ceiling. So what are these statistics? Well, I'm kind of looking at um, the, the distribution of, uh, of men's earnings. You know, kind of look at men that are working full-time, full-year, and then uh, ask what is the share of women 
that have earnings that is above the 50th percentile of the man distribution, or above the 80th percentile of the man distribution, or above the 90th percentile of the man distribution. So if there was equal representation of women in this you know, kind of part of the distribution, you would expect that about half of women would be above the 50th percentile of the men's distribution, that about 20% of women would be above the 80th percentile of the men's distribution, and about 10% of women would be above the 90th percentile of the men's distribution. And you can see that, again, there, there's been quite a lot of progress with increasing representation of women in this upper moment of, uh, of the earnings distribution, but certainly by 2010, still very much of a glass ceiling. And in fact, the higher up you go into the distribution, in fact, that's kind of this, the definition of the glass ceiling phenomenon, the more women tend to be uh, underrepresented, right? So in the 90th percentile, what you would like, we hope to see 10% of women, you know, above the 90th percentile of the men distribution, you only see um, kind of less, uh, less than 3%. And again, in terms of the trend, as I said, there's been progress, but if you compare 2000 and 2010, these numbers are again essentially the same. So it looks like the progress that has been happening in the early decades is somewhat, uh, somewhat stalled. The, I think, nicest and most comprehensive pictures we can build for the US about women's representation, not just in the top 10% of the income distribution, but really go towards you know, the, highest, uh, the highest percentile is this work that um, um, Piketty and Saez and Zuckman did with, with RIS data. So the data I showed before, census data, where we have some top coding. It's hard to really study the very um, top of the income distribution. In the RIS data, um, just like in the registry data you have, there's no top coding, so you can really see what's happening at the very top. And the story you know, that I've given you for the top 10% is essentially the same if you move to the top 1% or top 0.1%. So you see that um, the share of women, uh, again, if this was equal representation of both gender in the top, you would like to see both of the green and the blue and the red line reaching 50%. You see that you are well below that, and the higher up you go into the income distribution, the fewer uh, women you're going to find. And, you know, I think one could look at this picture and also say that maybe there's been quite, you know, substantive progress between the 1980s and the 2000s, but those trend lines have somewhat flattened, uh, flattened since. Right. So the last fact that, that I want to mention is that <coughs> it is not what's driving these pictures is not solely that we don't have women in management, that we don't have women you know, that are doctors, that we don't have women represented in the highest earnings occupation in, uh, in the economy. It is also a fact that whenever you find women in those high earnings occupation, they systematically tend to earn less than men in those occupations. So this is a picture that comes from uh, Col Claudia Goldin's uh, presidential lecture a few years back. What is each dot? Well, each dot represents a particular occupation, and we are restricting ourselves to about the 80th highest earnings occupation uh, in the US. What you have on, on the x-axis is men's average earnings within those occupations. And what you have on the y-axis is the difference between women's earnings in those occupations and men's earnings in those occupations. So I think they are really just two main facts when you look at this picture. The first one is that except for one little triangle um, at the uh, pink triangle, every one of these points is below zero. That means that in all of these occupations, women earn less than men. It's the first fact. And I think the other fact that is striking about this picture is that if you were to try to draw a line to this picture, you would be a downward sloping line, which in English essentially means that the, highest, um, the higher the earnings within an occupation, the bigger is the gender gap in earnings. In occupations that pay more, women are particularly under-earning compared to men within that occupation. Okay, I'm going to come back to this picture um, later on. All right, so before trying to kind of give you a sense of kind of where, where the literature has gone on, on trying to, you know, explain where we are, I also find it worthwhile to take a moment to say, wh what do we care about all of this, right? Wh why these facts something that, you know, we should do research on or have newspapers writing stories about? And, and I think there are really different ways 
to look at these facts and answer the why we should care question. One is really a question about justice and fairness, and certainly, if you think about you know, the way this is written about in the paper, if you think about advocacy groups that are concerned with these questions, I think at the core, they are really looking at it from a perspective of like um, justice and fairness. It should be equal pay for equal work. Now, a lot of the research I'm going to be talking about um, later on um, may kind of suggest that these gender gaps are not inconsistent with equal pay for equal work. Um, so, if there's not a matter of fairness and justice here, right, are there other reasons to care? Well, I think there are, you know, utilitarian reasons to care. There are efficiency arguments as to why we should care, right? If you think about, um, assume, and I'm going to be very willing to assume that, that talented birth is equally um, distributed between men and women, it has to be that as an economy we are not on the frontier of efficiency and productivity by solely tapping into male's talents to run the largest organizations in our country. Right? So there's really an efficiency argument as to why countries must be leaving money on the table by not having a more equal representation of one, men and women uh, in business. One of my colleagues, um, Cheng Tai Che, mentioned, I think, some of this work uh, at lunch to Yan, try to do an exercise um, that is kind of more structural in nature and has assumptions, but to try to kind of back out, like, how much more efficiency. So what they did in this work is kind of go back to the U.S. over a 50-year period between 1960 and 2010 and try to measure how much extra GDP growth the U.S. got simply from getting a reduction in the barriers of entry of women and other minorities into a set of occupations where they were previously underrepresented. Right. So, there's no way you can do this kind of quantification without assumptions, but if you believe the assumptions, they would say that about a quarter of the growth that the U.S. experienced over the last 50 years can be explained by the increasing representation of women and minorities in occupations where they were not represented before. And then, I think another reason why we should care is that, another efficiency-based reason as to why we should care is that there's really just value in diversity. And certainly, you know, a lot of organizations are going to claim that, you know, diversity and inclusion is really going to be good for the corporation. It's going to make firms, uh, firms more productive. I, what, 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 as a researcher, um, this is an area that has been very frustrating to me because I, I can see, I can hear these arguments, but if I look at what we know, uh, I don't think we have good empirical evidence that diversity in leadership is good for business. We have a lot of great... Um, correlational evidence that firms that are more diverse, have more diverse leadership, are doing better, but all of this evidence really suffers from the chicken and egg problem. And um, I, 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 I strongly believe that we should have more work in this area um, that, that validates that you know, diversity and inclusion are really uh, productivity enhancing. So this is my, you know, kind of my overview as to why, why one should care about these questions. All right, so what I'm going to do in the, in the rest of the, of the talk is, is kind of give you a sense of where um, economic research has gone over the last 20 years or so to try to explain why women are still struggling in the labor market along the lines that I, um, that I documented. And I'm going to talk mainly about two areas. I'm going to talk about the work on um, gender difference in psychological attributes. I'll do that much more briefly. And then I'll talk about work that has been closer to me um, that has been really more focused on issues of, of flexibility and work-family balance, kind of the, the more kind of traditional old, old school explanation. And then in, um, in the second part, I, I'll talk a little bit about um, the role that, that policy, be it corporate policy or public policy, uh, might be able to play in trying to accelerate uh, convergence um, at the top of the, of the distribution. Okay? So, as I said, over the last 20 years, there's been a flurry of, of laboratory experiments. So, um, in, in economics, we, people do lab experiments. I don't do lab experiments. So, I think sometimes people are like, how can economists do lab experiments? They don't have guinea pigs, uh, but we have students. Um, so, what we do is that we take students and we put them in a controlled environment where we get them to play games. And from getting them to play those games, we learn something about 
you know, their preferences, their attitudes. And over the last, I say about now two decades, there's been a lot of this work in the lab trying to tell us something about systematic differences between men and women on a set of traits. And the argument has been that these systematic differences between men and women on the set of traits could be really relevant in explaining educational, occupational choices, and ultimately labor market outcomes, especially at the top of the income distribution. So this work has documented that, I think in a fairly robust fashion, that women tend to be more risk-averse uh, than men. Um, some of this work is documented in a maybe somewhat less robust fashion, that women may do more poorly if you put them in a more competitive environment. If you get them to play uh, a game where you're not going to pay them, you know, a little bit more for each task that they solve, but you're going to raise, you're going to attach a prize to, you know, doing well. Put women in these environments, they seem to be doing more poorly, and women seem to really dislike being in this kind of high-stake uh, competitive environment. This work that Linda Babcock has done, suggesting that women may not be negotiating as much as men, even though I think there's some uncertainty as to whether they are doing that because they don't like to negotiate or because they understand that negotiating will be bad for them. Uh, and there's also work suggesting that uh, women may, may lack self-confidence compared to men or that men tend to be overly confident in themselves um, compared to women. So, this work is relevant to trying to understand the glass ceiling from many different perspectives. Well, let me just take the examples of, of risk aversion. Right. Um, how could risk aversion and how women's kind of higher level of risk aversion be relevant to explaining the labor market outcomes? Well, it is the fact that if you look at occupations, there is a relationship between how uncertain earnings are within a particular occupation and average earnings in that occupation. Right. Think about, you know, kind of entrepreneurship. Entrepreneurship is a fairly risky stake that, you know, may lead to fairly high earnings on average with lots of risk associated with it. It's just one example. Now, if women are more risk averse than men, they may decide to select out of occupations that have more risk associated with them. But if these occupations are also higher average earnings occupation, that means that women are going to be systematically selecting in lower uh, earnings occupation. Okay. It's just one example, but this work is, you know, could be made um, quite relevant to uh, understanding the glass ceiling. Now, these differences that have been documented in the lab, even if you know, they exist, um, could be due to very different sources. They could be due to nature, like men and women are born, you know, are wired, you know, differently when it comes to attitude to risks, or they could very well be a result of the way we raise our kids uh, and nurture results. I'm not going to talk much about this debate, but it is very much an active debate, and I'm looking at Peter over there, that is just telling us a lot of, um, I think, helping with this re recent work, kind of uh, guide, uh, guide this debate. My reading of the evidence so far is that people would say 50 nature, 50 nurture, which seems to be the typical answer for, for an economist when you, when you press them for an answer. All right. So, as I said, most of this work has been taking place in the lab with guinea pigs that are typically uh, undergraduate, uh, undergraduate students. What has been happening more recently, and you really don't have to read all those numbers, but um, is that people have tried not to take this work outside of the lab, and try to give us a sense of like, okay, so you've documented that these differences may exist on average in the lab. How much uh, does it matter in terms of um, explaining earnings differences? And so this is an example of the studies. Maybe this list should be updated. Sorry, hold on, this is falling off. Yes. Um, this, is a, this is kind of a, a review of the studies that have tried to essentially add these traits, these risk aversion to a standard regression that would explain gender gap in earnings. And I guess what's most you know, kind of relevant to me is, is the last column in this table and the kind of numbers they give you. Those numbers are essentially the researchers trying to assess, okay, how much of the gender gap can I explain away once I account as well as I can for these differences in preferences between men and women? And if you look at these numbers, they are really above 10%. 
So the research so far, and I don't think it's definitive, but the way I read this research is that, yes, these differences between men and women exist, but they don't seem to explain much of the actual difference in learnings that we see uh, in the labor market. I mean, I can talk briefly about one of the studies that was done on students at my business school, this, the study by uh, Luigi Zingales and co-authors, where they studied all students, male and female students, they measured uh, their attitudes towards um, um, competition, the willingness to compete, and then they tried to say, okay, I see your differences between our male and female students in terms of how much they make when they leave the business school, how much of this gender gap that I observe in earnings while students leave a business school can be linked to a fact that our female students dislike competing more than our male students. And in their case, it's 10%. So there is some differences, even among a very selected group of MBA students, there's differences in attitudes towards competition, but that explains very little of the gap in earnings. So again, in summary, my, my review of this work is that this work has made a huge amount of progress. I think it established important facts in the lab. I think that work still has a lot um, to do in terms of, I think, convincing us that these forces are really first order in terms of explaining why women are not um, kind of entering the upper part of, uh, of the earnings distribution. Um, and so, but my reading of it is that, you know, the magnitudes that exist so far suggest that these influences are limited. So now let me turn to the second, you know, areas of research that, you know, has been closer to my own work um, and in, is much more, much more old school in many ways. Um, there, the explanation for, um, for the gap is simply related to the fact that women have a greater demand for flexibility at work than men, right? Now, why, uh, why is this relevant? Well, because many of the highest paying jobs have long hours and inflexible schedule. Then many of you know, the most financi financially rewarding careers requires that you're going to be continuously attached to the workforce and are going to be such that if you leave the fast track for six months, you will not be able to re-enter uh, where you were as if you, know, you had not had uh, a labor uh, force participation disruption. Now, because women remain the dominant providers of, of childcare, and you, know, you should have a broader view than just childcare, I mean, remain the, the dominant providers of, of non-market work, these demand for uh, long hours, inflexible schedules, no career interruptions, are going to be particularly detrimental to women that do not have as much flexibility as men. All right. So let me try to kind of document this fact with a few things. I want to go back to something that uh, I studied that I did not kind of nearly 10 years ago, which is crazy, where again, we used our students at um, the Booth School of Business, um, didn't get them to play any games. I, we just surveyed them to try to get a sense of um, their earnings profile after they, um, they left the business school. So this is a very appealing sample in that it's extremely homogenous. All of the men and women that are, you know, in this study have all been admitted to the same highly selective business school in the country, right? They are as matched on attributes as could hope uh, to, uh, to have them. So this picture documents what happened to uh, our male and female students' earnings over time from the year they leave the program up until 12 plus years uh, after the program. As you can see, there's, there is a gender gap in earnings at the time all students kind of leave the business school, but that gap at the time they leave the business school is minuscule compared to how much this gap increases over time. Obviously, like in all those things where you're going to have extreme outliers, the differences in means are much more extreme than the difference in, in medians are, but the difference in means suggests that our female students earn essentially half of what our male students do. And these are numbers that do not, to be very explicit, impute zero earnings to the women that are not working. These are numbers that are based on conditional on working uh, what, you, what you earn. Okay? So 
what we what we did after this is try to explain, you know, kind of can, how can we make sense of this? You know, these are dramatic differences. Well, the next thing we did is basically ask these young men and women um, about their the labor supply uh, over over the time since they left uh, since they left school. So these are just a few statistics. I'm going to highlight the bits where you know I put some red circles. So. Number one, not surprisingly, you know, there are going to be more male students, more female students than male students that will have taken some time of work over the 10 years since they graduated from the program. These differences are not huge, right? So if you look 10 years out, the cumulative number of years that our female students have not been working is, is one year compared to like a tenth of a year for our male students, okay? So these people are working, but they have, the women have been taking some time off. The other thing that is, you know, kind of maybe not surprising, but is going to end up being very important, is that while at the time they leave the business school, our male and female students each work about 50 hours a week, when you go 10 years out, our male students are still in the 57 hours range, our female students have gone down to about 50 hours. Okay? So, these are facts that document that there are divergence, not large quantitatively, but divergence in terms of the labor supply of our male and female students, both in terms of accumulated experience and lengths of uh, hours worked. Now, what we did after that is just, you know, feel like a very kind of descriptive exercise, but how much are these real, but not very large differences in labor supply between our male and female students, how much can those account for the very large gap in earnings? And the answer is that they can explain a lot, right? So the first row over here is simply the raw differences in, uh, in wages, sorry, in earnings between our male and female students. At the time they leave school, it's about 9%. 10 years out, it's 56% uh, gender gap. And then what we do after is essentially ask, what's left of this gender gap when I account for A, B, C, D? Now, if I just account for pre-MBA characteristics, you know, it explains some of the gender gap, but not a lot. There's some differences, you know, between our students at the time they enter the school, such as where they've worked, what industry. There are some differences um, in terms of, like, how well they do in the MBA program, which, let's focus on the last column, don't do much to uh, explain the gender gap in earnings. And then you get super large bang for your buck when you account for two things. One is, as I showed you before, that women have accumulated somewhat less experience than men. It's not a lot, it's a small amount. But this gap in actual experience are extremely um, taxing in terms of earnings. And then the very last row is simply accounting for those five hours or so differences on average in the length of the work week and you can see that that explains a huge part of what's left in the gender gap in earnings. So essentially, as you go from the first row to the last one, you've taken uh, close to 60% gap in earnings and taken down to less than, you know, less than 10%. Now, you could add more controls. This is not the goal of this exercise. The goal of this exercise was really to show you that these differences in labor supply, row three and four, are extremely important in explaining why our female students do not earn as much as our male students. Now, since then, people have looked at law students, they've done studies that are similar, and they've found very much the same, the same message, is that small differences in labor supply play a very large role in explaining the gender gap in earnings in, um, in the business sector. Let me go back to this picture that I think tried to put this story um, in uh, in, a broader, in a broader frame. If you look at what's happening between row 4 and row 5, right, why would these small differences in hours worked explain so much of the wage gap? Well, I think you have to get in your mind a model where we are in occupations here, where if you work 5% longer a week, your earnings are going to go up by more than 5%. You are in an environment where there is this non-linear pay as a function of how much you work, 
the kind of occupation that our students enter are occupations where the reward for, longing, for working longer hours is not linear, it is more exponential. The more you work, you're going to get more earnings. This is trying to put that in the broader frame of all these higher paying occupations. So this is a picture I showed you before. This is the relationship that, you know, as I pointed out, you know, if you look at the highest earnings occupation in the economy, this is also the occupations where the gender gap in earnings is the largest. And in this picture, there's something slightly different. So the y-axis is, again, the gender gap in earnings between men and women. But what is on the x-axis is different. It's basically a metric to get at like what I was saying before. If I work 5% longer week in these occupations, by how much do my earnings go up by, right? If they go up by zero, well, you're going to be at zero over there. You, the, elasticity, the elasticity of your earnings to hours worked is going to be very, very small. If you are towards the right-hand side of the x-axis, these are the kind of occupations where you give me 5% more time, I'm really going to increase your pay a lot, okay? And you can see that across these occupations, um, the first, essentially all these dots are, you know, have positive elasticity of, of income to, uh, to hours worked. But I think even more interestingly that, again, if you were to draw a line here, you would see this line to be uh, downward sloping, right? So women are particularly struggling compared to men in terms of earnings in those occupations where the reward for working very long hours is particularly high, okay? So think about these occupations, occupations where this flexibility that women are demanding is going to be very, you know, very costly. And this is exactly what you see um, in those numbers, okay? All right. So if I've convinced you that, you know, kind of inflexible work is, is a big driver of, of why women are underperforming men, at the top of the income distribution. Now, why is it that you know, inflexible, if inflexible work is particularly difficult for women? Well, I think the first old explanation is just essentially children. Right? So I can again go back to this study we did uh, more than 10 years ago and go back to documenting gender differences in labor force participation, accumulated experience, hours worked between now not just men and women, but really men and two groups of women, women that have children and women that do not have children. And the way to read this, first row is, as we said before, women um, are, have accumulated less experience than men, and they work about a 9% shorter, shorter week than men. Now let's decompose women between those that have children and those that do not, again, compared to men. Right? What you can see here is that Yes, there are differences between men and women without child, but those differences are very, very small. In fact, if I were to summarize the numbers on this table, you would say that there are men and women without kids, and they're essentially similar in terms of a labor force participation and hours worked. The group that is really different are women that have, uh, that have children, right? So just, you know, kind of illustrating this, the very last column would say that the gap in uh, weekly hours work between men and women with, without children is 3%. It is close to 25% between men and women with, uh, with kids. Now, there's been, you know, kind of since this work, kind of a, a cottage industry that is still happening of papers that have now been really focused on understanding and measuring this, um, this child penalty. So it's called the child penalty. Um, I went to Singapore last year, and I talked about child penalty, and the people in government were very, very unhappy that I mentioned child penalty in an environment where, um, you know, people, the government really wants people to have children. Um, but, you know, this is how it's being referred to. What is the exercise here? Simply trying to measure what happens to one's earnings when they have, when they have a child, and try to do that as, you know, as precisely as, as possible. So I'm going to show you some of the the results that have come out from Sweden, they actually were the first ones. And then we've had a very nice study looking at Denmark, but methodologically it's fairly similar to the Swedish study. And then now, um, actually, The Economist was tweeting about 
the, the latest data, I haven't seen the papers, but I just saw the picture in the economies that have come out for, for Germany and Austria, and all of these studies look remarkably the, remarkably the same in terms of what they find. So, what's going to happen here? All of these studies do the following. You know, take your very rich administrative data, like the one you have here in, in Sweden, uh, look at couples, men and wife and hu husband and wife, track their earnings over time in the panel that you have access to, and then see what happens to these earnings of the couples at the time the first child is born. Okay? Very simple kind of event study analysis using the birth of the first child as being kind of the, the shock. Okay? So the picture I'm going to show you, I focus at the, on the entire population of, uh, of, of Sweden and Denmark, and I'll focus on the very top. Uh, so that's one caveat. And then, you know, this is data that comes from, you know, Scandinavia, which, you know, I'm going to talk a bit about gender norms later, is, is, a, special, is a special environment. But um, as I said, you know, I, I believe that we're going to see similar pictures coming from many other places outside of Scandinavia. So this is Sweden, which is the only slide I have on Sweden, so enjoy it. Um, so what is this? This is tracking yearly income of men and women that are part of a match of a couple, all right? So think about, you know, kind of, we are tracking couples' earnings from year minus 10, which is 10 years before the birth of the first child, to 15 years after the birth of the first child. And zero is the time where the first child is born, okay? And then, um, what do we see? Well, if you look pre-birth of a first child, there is a gap in earnings between husbands and wives. Okay, it's a positive gap in earning. But there's one clear event where that gap explodes and really never recovers in this data, and it's really when the first, the first child is, uh, is being born. Okay? Let me show you the Danish data, which is just, you know, kind of the flat line there don't mean that there's something different between Sweden and Denmark. It's they, they normalize things slightly differently. But this is a picture for Denmark looking at earnings and looking at the labor supply dimensions. Again, zero is the birth of the first child. Essentially, no differences between men and women, no pre-trend between men and women before the birth of the first child. The first child is born, nothing happens to men's earnings, women's earnings take a massive hit and do not come back. And that's mapped into um, kind of um, labor supply responses like the one you'd expect, which is at the time of the birth of the first child, women take more time out of, uh, out of the workforce, okay? And again, the argument linking back to inflexibility is that, you know, in high earnings occupations, this behavior is going to be very costly to women. All right. This is a nice picture from the, from the, um, the Cleveland and, and, Lande, and Lande study, which uh, I think tells, take a country like Denmark, go back to the 1980s, right? Try to explain the gender gap earnings in the 1980s, not try to do that in the 2010s. How do you explain this gender gap? Well, if you go back to the 1980s, there's all the reasons as to why men and women are earning different amounts. Back in the 1980s, the educational achievement of the man is higher than that of the woman. So part of the explanation 30 years ago as to why women all earn men is that they are simply less educated. But back in the 1980s, there was also a child-related source for the gender gap. And there was all the stuff when you've accounted for education and children that they could not explain, which we typically label residu res residual inequality. You can label it whatever you want. If you want to make that discrimination, sexism, you know, you can label it. Um, but what's striking is that by today, essentially, everything that is, you know, all of the gender gap in earnings is related in Denmark to this child penalty. There's obviously nothing left to be explained by education for the reason I stated before. And in fact, in their context, they find there's no residual inequality in Denmark to, um, to um, we don't need to, label any of the inequality residual, it's all related to children. And furthermore, I think what's striking is that the child gender-related inequality has not changed at all. It has not gone down in magnitude, which is, I think, another very, very striking fact in light of some of the things I'm going to discuss next. All right. So, 
What have I said so far? So, women need more flexibility than men, mainly because they have children. And if you want to be a high earner, if you want to just crack the top of the income distribution, demanding needing that flexibility is going to be particularly costly. Okay? Hence, uh, hence the glass ceiling. Now, I guess what I would like to ask next is that should this be puzzling, right? So, why is it that today um, women still are paying such a high price in the labor market for essentially being mothers? Um, and in many ways, there are various forces that we know to have been operating that should be making this price not as high. In particular, now market work has changed and gender role attitudes have changed as well. So let me talk about you know, each of these very briefly. So what I have in mind here when I talk about the amount of market work is going back to the, you know, the dishwashers and the washing machine and you know, kind of the pre-packed baby food, all of those things that have made it much easier to be a mother but, uh, but also have, uh, have a job. So the idea that in the old days, if a woman worked, she really had a double shift, she worked at home and then she had another full work day in the home doesn't match the environment of today. And that's especially true if um, you think about the more educated uh, among us, people with the highest earnings, is that the ability to outsource a lot of this childcare is particularly, um, is particularly um, high for, for higher earnings uh, people. Now, I don't feel like I've got a good explanation as to why we don't see this change in the amount of non-market work being more immediately reflected in the data, but there's certainly something, in the US at least, that I think has been an important countervailing forces. And I still don't know whether that kind of generalizes beyond the US, but even though non-market work has been going down overall in the US, the amount of time that parents slash mothers in particular, especially the highest educated mothers, are spending on parenting is being going up quite dramatically. Right? So there's one countervailing force, which is that the amount of time spent on parenting has been trending up, particularly among the women that should be you know, the one with the potential to you know, kind of become, if they stay on their career track, CEOs of, uh, of companies. That's been well established. The reason as to why this is going on is, I don't think, fully clear. I think one could link this to the rise in income inequality. Everyone is fighting for getting their kids into into Harvard or MIT or Princeton, and that means that we really have to remain focused on them from, from week one to age 18. Um, so I think this might be you know, part of the explanation, but that's an important phenomenon, and I think that is still under, under study. Well, the, other, the other thing that has been changing and should make these forces um, less, uh, these, this, the, 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 the child penalty not as large as before, is that gender role attitudes also have moved, right? So, if you look at survey questions where you ask people, men and women, about their views about women in the workforce, um, these views have changed dramatically, right? Go back in the old days, lots of men and women would say that, you know, women should be, you know, men should be taking priority over women in terms of who's going to be in the workforce. Now you see much less of that, right? Now, it is true that we've seen some convergence on these gender role attitudes. What is also true is that there's some norms that look like they've been slower to converge than others. So when it comes to women's access to the labor market, equal access to the labor market compared to men, lots of convergence. One norm that is measured systematically over time that has been much more sticky is views as to kids, as to whether kids can do well if they have a mom that is in the workforce. There again, you've seen some convergence, but still quite a lot of people out there that are resistant to the view that a child can be a help, you know, healthy uh, and, and doing well child if, uh, if he or she has uh, a working mother. Another, you know, another thing about these gender role attitudes is that the set of norms that we should be looking at may be, um, you know, kind of maybe, maybe changing. So I've done some work not so long ago looking at the relevance of a norm that is not, you know, historically was not relevant. The idea that men should be earning more than their wives, right? So if you go back, you know, kind of 30 years ago, that was not a norm that was relevant. It was not biting for anybody. Now this is a norm that is going to become biting. 
Right. So what we do in this work is really document that this norm really matters, that it seems to slow down women's earnings, that it seems to be also affecting marital stability uh, and a set of outcomes. And then finally, there are other manifestations of gender norms. Uh, going back to the point I made about nature versus nurture, maybe we should think about the idea that women should not compete, women should not take risks, women should not be too ambitious as being all the reflections of gender norms. And as I mentioned before, these norms, if you view these traits as norms, they do exist. All right. So how am I doing on time? Move on. All right. <laughs> Good. I'm going to move on. All right. So let me just go five minutes. Let me talk very briefly about, you know, about policy. Um, is there a role for public policy, be it corporate policy or public policy, to play here, all right, uh, and help access the convergence? So, first one, you can think about work family amenities and trying to provide more of these work family amenities in the workplace. What do I have in mind here? A range of things. Allowing, you know, kind of women to work from home, extending the lengths of maternity leave, providing more part-time, more shorter hours, more flexibility to, you know, whoever wants it during, uh, during the workday. Now, what is true that this flexibility, you know, all these policies may achieve the objective of bringing and retaining more women in the workforce. These policies are not going to solve the core problem that I talked about before, right? If jobs are in the high-paying jobs are inflexible, by offering women more flexibility, you basically mean that they're going to be able to work in those higher-paying jobs, right? So this, these policies may, in fact, even backfire in that as you raise the cost for companies of you know, hiring women, companies may just decide, I don't want to put women in those positions. I don't want to assign them to um, a, set of, uh, a set of projects or clients that are particularly high profile. In fact, we have good um, evidence that suggests this is, this, is, this is relevant, even though this is another area where we should do more work. So if you look at the US compared to OECD countries, the US is quite different in that we don't offer much in terms of maternity leave and flexibility and rights to part-time and things like that. Now, compared to all the OECD countries, the US has struggled more in keeping women's labor force participation high. But on the other hand, it seems to be that in the US, more than in all other OECD countries, when women are working, they're going to be more likely to be in these higher paying jobs. So consistent with the idea that these policies may bring more women to the workforce, but may not succeed as much into bringing them towards the, um, the, the top of the income distribution. Another policy which you know, is, is, is very you know, popular here is, is, is just trying to gender neutralize childcare. Right? And there, what I have in mind is the daddy months, the daddy quotas, the paternity leave. Um, I think at the core of these policies, to me, are the ones that go the most directly towards the problem. Right? If the problem is that women pay a disproportionate price because they are the ones ultimately in charge of the children, any policy that is trying to kind of reduce this asymmetry is going to be quite impactful. Now we are starting some of seeing some of the first results of the impact of these policies, just the one in Sweden, in Norway, in Quebec. The results so far, I think, are kind of mixed in that we see the fathers taking the quota, but not a day extra compared to the quota. There is some limited sign that after the quota, they remain more engaged with the children. That's good. On the other hand, very few of the work, I think Quebec is the exception, has, has documented that the mothers, the wives of these fathers that are taking the daddy quota are benefiting in terms of the labor market uh, outcomes. But obviously, it's still very early on. Um, but in terms of the theory, these, these, th these policies are the most, uh, the most relevant one. I'm going to skip this. And I'm going to just finish with this. Um, so, if you think about the area in Europe that has been the most active, and now we're starting to see it in the U.S. as well, such as in California, um, to try to kind of address, you know, the glass ceiling, particularly in the corporate sector, it's been the quotas, uh, and in particular, kind of the, the board quotas uh, that many European countries have passed, Sweden being an exception. Um, so. How would these quotas work? I mean, kind of, what's the theory behind quotas? How can quotas make a difference for women? At the core, there's a mechanical effect. If you have quotas, where you're bringing women, you know, inside the boardroom, so you're bringing women, um, the when they become board members, into a position of influence. Now, these quotas could also work if you think that you know you're trying to break old boys' network, and you're trying to bring women in position of influence so that they can play a role in making sure that other women get appointed. 
Behind this is some kind of theories about homophily, that women, you know, will like other women more than, you know, uh, than other men. And there's also a role model effect, I think, associated with this quota. No. Whenever you talk about quotas, you always have to keep in mind just the potential adverse effect of quotas, in that they can really reinforce stereotypes, right? The only way women succeed is because we force seats for them, right? We make places for them. All right, so let me just tell you quickly about, you know, kind of work that I've done on the quotas. We've studied the Norwegian reform, uh, because it's the oldest one, it's now 20 years old. Uh, with the kind of data that you have access to in, in, in Sweden, which is really necessary to be able to look at the very top of the income distribution. So what have we learned about the Norwegian quotas in terms of the ability to change the dynamics that, I, that, I'm, interested, that I'm interested in? Well, we have learned that I think one very positive thing in the context of Norway is that the argument against the quota by business was always there are just no qualified women for these positions. Don't force us to appoint 40% of women. There's no way we can find women that are qualified. In fact, what we found in Norwegian case is that they found a lot of very qualified women. The women that were serving on the board after the quotas were in fact more qualified on observable than the women that were um, you know, serving on the board before. So that really is a success story, is that if you tell companies, look hard, they pay, the cost, they make the investment, they find the woman. Okay, that's the positive part. The negative part of our study is that beyond the very limited group of women that directly benefited from the quotas because they were appointed to boards, we found no spillover of these quotas anywhere else. Right? So quotas, a couple of hundred women in Norway are affected by the quota directly. Do you think that this policy is going to be transformational? It better be that you start seeing changes in the top management of the companies that now have 40% of women on their board. We found no evidence for that. We didn't find any evidence that women in the economy that have the profile of could-be board members are doing better today than they were pre-quota. No evidence that these quotas have any effects beyond the very restricted mechanical effects. And in the end, none of this should be very surprising. Because if you believe me on what are the root causes behind the underrepresentation of women, these issues of inflexibility and, and children, those have very little to do with um, boys' network and homophily and role models. And these quotas are really, you know, not directly addressing the core, the core problems. All right. I know I'm out of time, so I'm going to do this. This is my last slide. Um, so I guess I want to start by saying one thing, which is that I've talked for I don't know how long, hopefully not too long, even though I can see Frederick is getting very antsy. Um, I didn't talk about, I think I used the word discrimination and sexism once. I'm not claiming I don't argue, and it's really not that I believe that sexism and discrimination is irrelevant. Uh, what I really do strongly believe is that you can go a long part of the way in explaining why women are not there by relying on other arguments than discrimination and sexism. So, if you want to call you know, the residuals in the regression, discrimination, and sexism, I think this is fine, right? It's there, um, but you don't need to solely rely on that to explain what's going on. Were you to do that, I think you would really miss the key policy implications and the key policy step. So on the positive side, I think things are moving in the right direction for women, such as the quick changes you know, in the educational achievement. I think some of the other changes have been more slow. Think about the decline in norms. I had to skip through that, but you know, one could argue, and I've done some work suggesting that change in the structure of work and job design over the last 40 years may have made it particularly difficult for women. The idea that this non-linear pay phenomenon has become stronger over time has, may have hurt women despite, um, you know, other forces that may have helped them. And then, um, I don't know, what's going to happen next is anyone's guess. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you very much, Marianne. Uh, <clears throat> uh, I'm sure there are loads of questions at the moment. Since it's officially sort of announced that we should be, uh, so I suggest that those of you who want to catch Marianne on the way out, uh, catch her on uh, on the way out. Uh, on the way out. <laughs> <laughs> so <laughs> uh, and.
the final note on behalf of the school is that, again, it has been a privilege to be part of this. It has been a privilege to, let, to know you, Marianne, and I hope the acquaintance is sort of <laughs> mutually, uh, <coughs> mu uh, mutually uh, positive so far, uh, and we hope to see you again in Lund. And as to the broader event, uh, Jan and Orsa and the family, uh, we are truly grateful for this possibility to invite such distinguished people here, uh, arrange these kind of events, or arrange the kind of events that we will be doing tomorrow. And there is, of course, no way for us to really uh, show it. But uh, nevertheless, we have taken this. So thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.